Alaska is beautiful, but also dangerous. Over the years, from the early 1900s until today, many serial killers, spree killers, and mass murderers have stalked the territory and then the state of Alaska. Serial killers terrified settlers in Alaska long before profilers coined the term serial killer. Gold prompted most murders during the gold rush era. A near total lack of law enforcement in Alaska in the early 1900s allowed human predators to prowl the territory and terrorize the settlers and gold miners. We will never know how many people Ed Krause murdered or how much money, gold, fox furs, and other valuables he stole. But what we do know paints Krauss as one of the darkest figures in Alaska's history. Between 1912 and 1915, several single prominent businessmen vanished in southeastern Alaska, and alarmed citizens pressed law enforcement officials to investigate. When the federal authorities failed to spring into action, the Fraternal Societies of Juneau raised $1,500 to hire a private detective. This move, more than anything else, spurred the U.S. Marshal and the U.S. Attorney into action. Krauss was finally arrested, tried, and convicted. But when he escaped prison, it was a private citizen who shot and killed him. With the nickname Blueberry Tommy, Thomas Johnson sounds like a harmless and even friendly historical figure. But nothing could be further from the truth. Historians don't know much about Johnson, except that he was a serial killer. He was suspected of killing his young bride and her parents, as well as three passengers who hired him and his boat for a trip down the Yukon River. Johnson's murders occurred around the same time Krauss was terrorizing the Juneau area. Johnson spent time in southeast Alaska, as well as in the interior, and either killer could have committed several suspected murders in southeast. In 1949, Harvey Carrion murdered 58-year-old Laura Showalter during an attempted rape in the territory of Alaska. Carignan was in the U.S. Army and stationed in Anchorage at the time of the crime. After he was paroled in 1960, he continued his life of crime. In Washington, he was believed to have murdered 19-year-old Leslie Laura Brock. When 15-year-old Kathy Sue Miller answered a help-wanted ad for Carignan's gas station, he raped her, killed her, and disposed of her body. He also killed his 29-year-old girlfriend and violently raped several other women. For the murder of his girlfriend, Carignan was finally sentenced to life in prison. He died at Oak Park Heights Prison in Minnesota on March 6, 2023, at the age of 95. Leroy Butch Johnson was a troubled young man. His father thought he could solve Butch's problems by arranging a hunting trip for him with three Inupiat men in Kiana, Alaska, above the Arctic Circle. The hunt was scheduled for January 1970, when the temperature dropped to 50 degrees below zero. Freddie Jackson, Oscar Henry, and Clarence Arnold, all from Kiana, graciously included the 19-year-old man in their hunting party. Because of Butch's serious psychological problems, his father should have never sent him out onto the frozen tundra with strangers who spoke an unfamiliar language. Butch could not understand the men when they spoke in Yupik, and when they killed and gutted several caribou, Butch had what a psychiatrist called a psychotic break. As the men prepared to get into their sleeping bags for the night, Butch walked outside the tent and circled it, spraying the tent with bullets and murdering three good men who were trying to do him a favor. Anchorage and Fairbanks in the early 1970s were frontier towns with growing pains. Construction began on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline in 1973 and was completed in 1977. During this time, 
28,000 people worked on the pipeline. Oil field workers made good money, and while many pipeline employees hailed from Alaska, others came from the lower 48. The high wages created boomtown conditions in Fairbanks and Anchorage, and unemployment dropped to nearly zero in those cities. Off-duty workers spent lavishly, and crime rates spiked. Mobsters, drug dealers, prostitutes, and topless dancers followed the money to Alaska, and the police and troopers struggled to deal with the burgeoning crime wave. These conditions created the perfect atmosphere for monsters like Gary Zeger, Robert Hansen, and Richard Bunday. Gary Zeger, a brutal serial killer, stalked the streets of Anchorage in the early 1970s. We'll never know how many people Zeger killed, but eventually the psychopath made a fatal mistake. Gary Zeger used women and men for his momentary satisfaction and then discarded them. Authorities believe Zeger murdered at least a dozen individuals. Finally, he crossed the wrong people, and he was found dead near the Seward Highway with a shotgun blast to his chest. He was only 20 years old when he died. Robert Hansen is Alaska's most notorious serial killer. Hansen terrorized South Central Alaska from 1971 to 1983. Authorities suspect Robert Hansen murdered more than 30 women, and some speculate he also murdered men. Although Hansen never admitted it, investigators believe from studying the evidence of where Hansen's victims started and where they were finally killed, that Hansen would abduct a woman, take her into the wilderness, rape her, and order her to run while he hunted her down as if she were one of his big game trophies. Investigators found an aviation map hidden behind the headboard of Hansen's bed. The map had 24 X marks on it, and Alaska State Troopers found human remains near 17 of the X marks. After a string of closely spaced murders of young women in the late 1970s and early 80s in North Pole, Alaska, near Fairbanks, the abductions and murders stopped. The Alaska State Troopers believed the killer had moved somewhere else, but at the time they had no database to track the predator's movements beyond Alaska. With solid police work and deductive reasoning, the troopers pinpointed the murderer as Thomas Richard Bunday, an airman who had been stationed at Isleson Air Force Base near Fairbanks during the Alaska murders and then was transferred to Shepard Air Force Base near Wichita Falls, Texas. Two Alaska State Troopers went to Shepard Air Force Base to interview Bundy, and he admitted to the murders. However, before they could escort him back to Alaska, Bundy drove his motorcycle into an oncoming truck. Authorities do not believe Charles Sinclair murdered anyone in Alaska but he cleverly hibernated in Alaska. He returned to Alaska between his crimes, making it nearly impossible for police to track him. He lived a quiet life in Alaska with his wife and two kids in the isolated farming community of Kenny Lake. In addition to hibernating between his murders and robberies, Sinclair frequently changed his name, confusing authorities who tried to pick up his trail. Witnesses who spotted Sinclair in the vicinity of some of the murders reported he was a large man with a gap between his two front teeth, a scar on his right hand, a southern accent, and an outgoing, friendly personality. This description, along with Sinclair's penchant for murdering coin shop owners and then selling their valuable collections, helped investigators track Sinclair and his crimes across the United States. The authorities believe Sinclair murdered at least nine people between 1980 and 1990. Alaska State Troopers arrested Sinclair near his home in Alaska. He took an overdose of blood pressure medicine in prison 
and died before he could be brought to trial. On the evening of May 3, 1982, police discovered the bodies of four teenagers in Russian Jack Springs Park in Anchorage. The two boys had been camping in the park for a few days, and the girls were their friends. Hikers in the park reported seeing a menacing man with a shiny blue bicycle. Police traced the bike to the shop where it was sold to Charles Meach, an inmate at the Alaska Psychiatric Institute who had been released from the institute on a day pass. Dr. Mason Robeson at the institute noted that Meach's control over his aggression seemed fragile and he feared Meach would reoffend if not kept in a secure setting. Robeson said he felt Meach was the most dangerous patient in the hospital and perhaps in the state of Alaska. Over Robeson's objections, other doctors at the Institute began lowering Meach's medications and allowing him more freedom to come and go from the hospital. After Meach's rampage, the Alaska legislature amended sentencing laws for the criminally insane from some of the most lenient in the country to the toughest. On a foggy September day in 1982, someone murdered eight people on the fishing vessel Investor while it was docked in Craig, Alaska. The victims were shot to death and then the boat was set on fire. The dead included the captain, Mark Colthurst, his pregnant wife, Irene, and their two young children, aged five and four, as well as four crew members. The authorities were slow to respond to the burning boat, and any possible evidence was lost in the fire. Several witnesses saw a man going back and forth to the investor before the vessel was set on fire, but after the time when the detectives believed the murders occurred. Some of these witnesses identified the man as John Kenneth Peel. One witness said Peel made incriminating remarks to her, and another saw Peel leaving the investor with a gun over his shoulder on the night of the murders. However, with only circumstantial evidence, Peel's first trial ended in a deadlock jury, and the jury acquitted him in a second trial. No one else has ever been arrested for the brutal murders. On Tuesday, March 1, 1983, the scattered residents near McCarthy, Alaska, began arriving at the airstrip to meet the weekly mail plane. Little did they know that Lewis Hastings, one of their neighbors, had concocted a crazy scheme to murder everyone while they waited for the plane and then kill the pilot once the plane landed. He then planned to fly to a pump station near the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline, about 80 miles west of McCarthy, where he would land and rig the plane to take off again without him in it. Next, he would steal a fuel truck and ram the pipeline while shooting at it. This action would badly damage the pipeline, and he hoped the oil would thicken in the cold winter temperatures and not do too much environmental damage. He then believed the fuel truck would burst into flames and char his body beyond recognition. He hoped people would think he had been murdered in McCarthy with the other residents, and his family would never know he was a murderer who committed suicide in the end. Hastings thought the pipeline would threaten his life in the wilderness, and he wanted to destroy it. The Alaska State Troopers caught and arrested Hastings before he could attack the pipeline but not before he murdered six of his neighbors. By the time Michael Silka reached Manly Hot Springs, 160 miles west of Fairbanks, he had already murdered at least one person, and perhaps others. However, something set him off on May 17, 1984, at the boat landing on the Tanana River and he murdered everyone who came to the landing within a span of a few hours. When six residents from the small village disappeared, their families and friends contacted the Alaska State Troopers. As soon as the troopers realized that one of the vehicles parked at the landing belonged to Michael Silka, a person they were already searching for in connection with the disappearance of a Fairbanks man, 
They began scouring the river, searching for a dangerous fugitive. The Alaska State Troopers Special Emergency Response Team buzzed low over the river, with snipers positioned in the open helicopter doors. They found Silka, but when they tried to convince him to surrender, he fired at the helicopter, killing one of the snipers and wounding another trooper. The second sniper opened fire on Silka, killing him instantly. Michael Silka murdered at least nine people, and probably more. Residents of Anchorage were shocked and frightened by the brutal murders of Tom and Ann Faccio and Ann's sister, Amelia Elliott, in their beautiful Anchorage home near Russian Jack Springs Park in April 1985. The police discovered Tom's and Amelia's bodies in the dining room on the first floor of their home. The killers had bound their hands with neckties and then shot them. They found Ann's body in an upstairs bedroom. Her hands were also bound, and she died from a single gunshot wound to the head. Were the murders the result of a home invasion? If so, not much was taken from the residents, and Tom died with $2,000 in his pockets. At first, the police had no leads in the case, but when Cordell Boyd told a former cellmate about the murders, investigators arrested and interrogated him. Cordell quickly implicated his girlfriend, Winona Fletcher, and said she murdered Anne upstairs and then came downstairs and shot Amelia. Cordell killed Tom. Cordell said the murders were Winona's idea. Winona Fletcher was only 14 years old at the time of the murders, and she is the youngest juvenile ever tried as an adult in Alaska. The jury found both Boyd and Fletcher guilty. Boyd was sentenced to 99 years, and the judge sent Winona Fletcher to prison for 135 years. In 1987, a horrific crime rocked Anchorage when Paul and Cheryl Chapman found the bodies of Cheryl's sister, Nancy Newman, and Nancy's two young daughters in their home. Someone had brutally raped and murdered Nancy and her daughters, Melissa, age 8, and Angie, age 3, displaying their brutalized bodies in their bedrooms. In an era before refined DNA analysis, detectives found no obvious evidence at the scene, but crime scene analysts scoured the home for clues. The killer had left pubic hairs near the bodies and on a damp washcloth in the bathroom sink, and the pubic hairs had lice egg casings on them. Detectives learned that their primary suspect in the case, Kirby Anthony, Nancy Newman's nephew, had pubic lice when the murders occurred. Investigators found enough circumstantial evidence to allow prosecutors to build a strong case against Anthony and the jury found him guilty of the murders and sexual assaults of his aunt and cousins. His sentence was so long that he would not even be eligible for parole for 120 years. When handing down the sentence, the judge stated that Kirby Anthony was the most dangerous offender ever to enter his courtroom. By the time John Joseph Fottenberry murdered his last victim in Juneau, Alaska in 1991, he had already killed four people over a span of four months. Fottenberry was a long-haul trucker, and his crimes crossed the United States. He murdered Donald Nutley in Oregon, Gary Farmer in New Jersey, Joseph Darren Jr. in Ohio, and Christine Guthrie when he returned to Oregon before traveling to Juneau, Alaska and befriending Jefferson Diffie at a bar. Diffie felt bad for Fottenberry because he had nowhere to stay, so he invited him back to his condo. Fottenberry thanked Diffie for his kindness by handcuffing and beating him and then fatally stabbing him 17 times. He then stole Diffie's wallet, bank card, and a 9mm handgun. The next day, Fottenberry withdrew $400 from Diffie's account. The police soon captured Fottenberry, and he received a 99-year sentence for the murder of Diffie. 
However, an Ohio court gave Fottenberry the death penalty, and after several appeals, Fottenberry was executed by lethal injection in July 2009. Joshua Wade was a brutal killer who preyed on women, and possibly men, in Anchorage. His killing spree probably began when he was a teenager. On September 2, 2000, he repeatedly raped and murdered Della Brown in a shed in Midtown Anchorage. He even molested her body after she was dead. Police felt they had gathered more than enough evidence against Joshua Wade, including incriminating accounts from the young men who were with Wade the night of the murder. So they arrested him and charged him with Della Brown's rape and murder, as well as six other counts, including tampering with evidence. Unfortunately, the case fell apart at trial. When the lead prosecutor suddenly stepped down, the case fell into the laps of two young, inexperienced attorneys, and they were not qualified to prosecute a murder case. Meanwhile, Wade had two of the best defense attorneys in the state. The jury found Wade not guilty on all charges except for tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to six and one-half years minus the time he had already served. He was released in 2004, and in August 2007, he murdered Mindy Schloss, a psychiatric nurse practitioner who lived near where he was staying. This time, Wade was not so lucky. After an in-depth investigation, the police arrested Wade. Alaska does not have the death penalty, but because Wade stole and used Mindy's ATM card and bank fraud is a federal crime, the federal government said they would pursue the death penalty against Wade for Mindy's murder. To avoid the death penalty, Wade pleaded guilty to the murders of Della Brown and Mindy Schloss. When accused of preying on women, Wade said he had also murdered three men. Authorities believe Wade murdered other women, but he would not admit to it. Joshua Wade is now housed at a maximum security federal prison where he spends most of his time in solitary confinement. Prison officials classify Wade as one of the most assaultive, predatory, riotous, or seriously disruptive prisoners. John Patrick Addis's fellow Alaska State Troopers revered him. He was the type of guy who seemed to be able to do everything. He was in top physical shape and had a brilliant mind. He was a sharpshooter and a pilot and adored his four children. However, after a while, his friends began to notice chinks in his armor. He said he saw miniature humans he called thems, and he forced his family to live in a primitive cabin in Fairbanks with no running water or electricity. After Addis' wife divorced him, he began to unravel. He abruptly resigned from the troopers and told his friends he was moving to Florida to attend medical school. Instead, he began a pattern where he would meet a reasonably wealthy woman, ask her to marry him, and then steal her money. In August 1986, Addis failed to return his children to Alaska after a court-ordered visitation. The FBI became involved in the case and released Addis's photo to the public. Eight months later, someone in a gym in Kalispell, Montana, recognized Addis from the photo and alerted authorities. Addis returned to Alaska and served one and one-half years of a four-year sentence. When released, he moved to Las Vegas and committed his first known murder. Joanne Albany dated Addis for several months, but finally grew tired of his obsessive behavior and told him she wanted to end their relationship. Her body and vehicle were eventually found in the desert. Addis then moved to Mexico, where he met and married a much younger woman. They had two children and seemed happy for a while. Then, on October 18, 2006, neighbors noticed a terrible smell coming from their apartment, 
and the police found Addis' wife and children dead. Addis disappeared, but several weeks later, a maid at a hotel in Guatemala City discovered the body of John Patrick Addis, dead on the bed in his room. The coroner listed the cause of death as a heart attack, but some authorities believe he committed suicide. Aaron Rodgers, 28, had his share of demons, and he had butted heads with law enforcement many times. Still, he seemed to be doing much better, living with his father, Christopher Rogers, and his father's fiance, Elan Morin, in Palmer, Alaska. No one knows what caused Aaron to snap. In the wee hours of the morning on December 2, 2007, he entered his father and Elan's bedroom and began swinging a machete at them. Elan was awake and thought a stranger was hitting Christopher with a stick. When she tried to grab the object, two of her fingertips fell from her hand, and she realized the weapon was a machete, not a stick. Aaron killed his father and left Elan clinging to life. She managed to call 911 and was whisked away to a hospital where she survived. Before the ambulance took her away, she told the police that Aaron had left in Christopher's truck and there was a gun underneath the seat in the truck. Aaron drove to Anchorage and ditched his father's truck, but kept the gun. At 7 a.m., he shot and killed a man warming up his vehicle in his driveway. A few hours later, he shot a woman walking through the park, and the next morning, he shot another man who was warming up a vehicle. This time, Aaron managed to steal the man's Jeep Cherokee. Both the lady in the park and the second man warming up his vehicle were in critical condition, but survived their wounds. It took police only one half hour to spot the stolen Jeep Cherokee and arrest Aaron Rogers. An Anchorage judge sentenced Rogers to 309 years in prison, and a Palmer judge added 189 years. A monster moved to Anchorage in 2007. Israel Keyes did not look evil. He appeared normal. To those who crossed his path, he seemed like a dedicated businessman, a doting father, and a loving boyfriend. But by the time he moved to Alaska, Israel Keyes was already a thief, an arsonist, a rapist, and a serial killer. He did not give up those hobbies when he arrived in Anchorage. When 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was kidnapped from the Common Grounds Espresso coffee stand where she worked as a barista, Anchorage went on high alert. Behavioral analysts consider Israel Keyes one of the most intelligent, organized serial killers ever to operate in the United States. His usual routine was to fly to an area of the country, rent a vehicle, and then drive sometimes hundreds of miles to find a victim. He buried murder kits around the country in areas he found interesting, and he often buried these kits years before he carried out a crime in that area. He placed each kit in a plastic five-gallon bucket with a tight-fitting lid and included such items as a shovel, plastic bags, money, weapons, ammunition, and bottles of Drano to help dispose of the bodies. He had a rule not to murder anyone near where he lived. He got sloppy when he abducted and murdered Samantha Koenig, and his downfall was when he used her ATM card to withdraw money. Police finally caught up with him in Lufkin, Texas, where they arrested him and sent him back to Anchorage. Keyes refused to talk about his crimes unless federal agents could assure him of a speedy execution. He told investigators that he had dumped Samantha Koenig's remains in Matanuska Lake, and he admitted to a few other murders, but he was vague and seemed to be playing games with the detectives. Finally, when federal investigators failed to set an execution date, Keyes cut his wrists and died in his prison cell. 
when a series of murders occurred in parks and on trails near Anchorage in the summer of 2016, residents demanded more information from the police. Were the murders related to each other? Was a serial killer stalking the city? Was it safe to go hiking after dark? And what were the police doing to solve these murders? At 7.45 a.m., on July 3rd, 2016, a bicyclist riding along a trail by Ship Creek near Anchorage discovered the bodies of two people who had been shot to death. The weapon used in the murders was a 357 Colt Python revolver. On July 29th, three teenage girls watched a man shoot another man who was riding a bicycle. The killer then took the bike and calmly rode away. Police determined that the gun used in this murder was the same as the one used to kill the previous two people. On August 28th, two victims were found at Valley of the Moon Park. They were also shot with a 357 Colt Python revolver, and police began searching for a serial killer. A little after midnight in the early morning hours of November 12, 2016, a man jumped out of a taxi without paying his fare. The cab driver called the police, and a short while later, Anchorage police officer Arne Saleo saw a man walking down the street. He stopped to talk to the man, but the stranger pulled his gun and opened fire on Saleo, hitting him four times. Saleo returned fire, and when another officer saw what was happening, he also began shooting at the man. Officer Saleo survived the gunfight, but the man did not. When investigators saw the man's gun, they knew this was the same gun used in the recent string of murders. The identity of the killer shocked many in Anchorage. His name was James Dale Ritchie. He had been a star athlete 22 years earlier when he'd attended East Anchorage High School. His teammates included future pro athletes Trajan Langdon and Mal Tosi. On September 30, 2019, a woman handed a memory card to the police. The woman had downloaded the contents onto the card from a phone she had stolen. It contained 12 videos and 39 images of a man beating and strangling a woman to death. The man had a distinctive English-sounding accent when he spoke, and the detectives recognized the accent and the man. He was already under investigation for another Anchorage murder. On October 2nd, a citizen called the Alaska State Troopers to report the presence of human remains outside of Anchorage on the Seward Highway near Rainbow Valley Road, 18 miles from the hotel where a killer had filmed his macabre videos of a murder. The remains near the highway resembled the woman in the photos and videos. The woman was 30-year-old Kathleen J. Henry. The police arrested Brian Stephen Smith, 48. Smith, a naturalized U.S. citizen, was born in South Africa. On October 16th, the Anchorage Police Department announced they had charged Brian Stephen Smith with an additional murder. According to the police, Smith had confessed to shooting a woman between 2017 and 2018 and he gave the detectives the location where he dumped her body. Authorities identified the second victim as 52-year-old Veronica R. Abuchuk. In February 2024, a jury found Smith guilty of the first-degree murders of both women. It seems likely that Brian Stephen Smith killed other women before he murdered Veronica Abuchuk and Kathleen Henry. He was a practiced torturer and killer by the times of those two murders. Many authorities believe that Smith is the latest in a long line of serial killers from Alaska. Alaska is home to many wild animals at the top of the food chain, including bears, wolves, lynx, 
wolverines, eagles, and killer whales. But humans are the most dangerous predators of all.